Crime Stoppers helps solve crime. Hi, this is Dan DiBardino, president of Crime Stoppers of Michigan, asking you to help us continue our work in keeping your neighborhood safe. Each year, more and more families turn to us for help seeking justice for their loved ones. Please help us by donating through our website, 1-800-SPEAK-UP.ORG. Any amount will help us. We are helping families every day, and you can too. Again, the website to donate is 1-800-SPEAK-UP.ORG. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit, 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation. You can reach us at 313-778-7600. My name is Robert Fapano. We're going to be with you now for the next two hours here on 910 AM, the Superstation. I also have with me a full studio again, uh, Keith Williams. Keith, uh, happy Father's Day. Same to you. You know, I, uh, I, it doesn't get as much attention, I think, as Mother's Day, but hey, we're all here. We're the bouquets on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the corners, you know. You know, wear our cologne, and, you know, the, the kind of stuff that men use, you know. Uh, well, I, I don't think you're going to see quite the same. Uh, Some of them trying to run, they got a, got a meat axe running their husbands out the door. <laughs> okay, um... Uh, Police Commissioner uh, Willie Burton, happy uh, Father's Day. Thank you. Happy Father's Day. Okay. And Tom Chorsky, who uh, has brought in um, uh, some donuts and coffee, which uh, he's our local caterer now. We (laughs) appreciate it very, very much. And Scotty Bowman, our local uh, uh, libertarian here who uh, I know puts up the good fight and uh, is going to lose again probably in 2020, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> with the way that it's set up. That's the protest part. I'll surprise you one of these days. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the protest part. And my yeah. two um, canine children um, get me a nice card this morning, I must say. Oh, okay. uh, happy Father's Day. You got two dogs at the... Yeah, 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 touch that. yeah okay. I got a daughter and a son. <laughs> Bob, oh, do you, you have a daughter and a son? Yeah. Okay, the, great. Bob, did you see in Arizona with them police? No, what? what it what? was horrible, man. A little girl... Walked out the, um, the dollar store with a with a dial, and so all of a sudden these police and the girl and the lady is pregnant, her and her husband, and um, the police came to the car pulling guns out. They took the guy, took the father, put him on the car, kicked his legs, man, and started cussing at him and all that other stuff. And then the, it, then the police officer told the daughter, told the wife. Um, raise your hand. She said, I'm pregnant. I can't do that, you know. And so it's, it hit social media, went viral. Now the mayor's coming out saying, we don't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> See, Bob, because you got a gun, don't make it right. No. Did they have a warrant for him or something? No. The, the, they had just walked out the dollar store. The girl inadvertently took the dial. Oh, took the dial? Yeah, a little baby, four years old. <laughs> okay. That's... <laughs> You think uh, you think they can handle it a little better than that? Most police officers it's are supposed all, to be it's, trained. It's, it's, and, and it goes viral. But see, Bob, you know, <clears throat> we take you know folks when they you know, when they go in law enforcement, they take a psychological test. They need to keep on taking <laughs> psychological tests. Some of them guys, but man, how do they pass them? What well, well, like fascinates that. me is that I didn't know pregnant women can't raise their arms. Well, I don't know. She might have had a difficult time with it. Well, Bob, one time somebody shared this with me. They said, you know, when officers are coming on to the force, they say to take the psychological test. But what about every year when it's their anniversary day? Should they take a, another psychological test? Well, uh, they have to go through a firearm training every uh, year. You know, you got to be able to go in and be able to uh, show proficiency in, in firearms. Yeah. So uh, you would think think psychologically, though, the, the way your mind is set, you're supposed to uh, be able to uh, uh, maintain, you know, there's a certain stability or floor uh, that you're not supposed to go below. You would think that psychologically they would be, you know, uh, initially well, when you're tested, but I'm not But sure. we also see, too, the problems of PTSD, that folks are exposed to so many traumatic things on the job. You know, it's like those uh, first responders who had to respond to Sandy Hook, and they saw things that no human should ever have to see. And, and that has an effect on you. That wears on you. Yeah, they do. We uh, The one experience we had when I was sheriff, uh, the bad one was uh, Flight 255 when the, it crashed. And, it, I mean, it, uh, to this day, I, I think about it and, and seeing and going out there, and you're on the tarmac. It, what was so odd about it is that everything around you 
you know, the media and everything, it's all noisy and everybody's coming at you and everything else. You go out where the actual, um, you know, crash happened and we're collecting people, uh, remains and things like that. I mean, it is, I mean, literally deathly quiet. It is so quiet and stuff like that. And uh, remember the sights that you see um, uh, that, that is part of that and, and going out. It, it sticks with you forever. What we did is that we didn't ask everybody to raise their hands who wants to get some help and stuff like that. We ordered everybody that worked on that detail that they had to go in for uh, some counseling so that nobody had to be embarrassed, nobody had to feel, you know, that they were being singled out or anything like that. We ordered, and it was like uh, 100 officers, we ordered them all to go through uh, some counseling uh, uh, in order to uh, catch anything that they might have. Bob, another question, another thing. You know, South Carolina's got they had this little form about African Americans, you know, and what now, you mean for the presidential? Presidential. Now they're showing up. You had what's in the Buddha Craig and uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, 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 Warren and, and all those folks. Yeah, this is my problem with this, Bob. You know. Now all of a sudden you want to show up and go meet with the black folk. <laughs> well, once every four years. Yeah, come on. <laughs> no, Bob, come on, man. It's so, it's so disingenuous, man. So how can I believe you? All of a sudden now you know my issue. But you had all the time to co-mingle you to mingle with black folks, you know, and find out what was going on there, what's in our minds and stuff. It's, uh, yeah, it, um you see, Eliz- you see Bernie Sanders is sinking in the polls. He should. <laughs> And Elizabeth Warren has moved up past him. I think the two of them are dueling who's the most left in terms of uh, uh, social Democrats. Bernie gave a, what they said a FDR speech that he's trying to, you know, connotate. What they're concerned about is that they're going to connect socialism with Venezuela and and communism and everything else. So he's trying to make the distinction politically because once that hook comes in, uh, it, you know, uh, in a capitalistic society such as ours, that's going to sink it uh, pretty quick. But the bottom line is this: <clears throat> all the candidates should run away from that, okay? You know, because I'm not, you know, I'm not into what Bernie's talking about. He's now a millionaire, so what is he talking <laughs> about, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I never was feeling Joe Biden. <laughs> well, but guess but what? what? He's but ahead. <laughs> he's ahead. At least he's, he has done something. Bernie ain't never done anything. <laughs> so, Keith, are you going with Are you going with Biden? I'm right now with Kamala Harris. Mm-hmm. See, I think she's in a great spot to come up. You know, at this point, like you know, I was saying the last time, back in 2007, we would have had President Jeb Bush. Right back in 2000, we would have had Hillary Clinton back in 2015. We would have had President Jeb Bush. So uh, right now, you can't just say that the leader is necessarily in that strong a position. Well, you know, it looks it looks awfully good for him, man, you know. And uh, it, the only good thing is he didn't go down the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> no, no escalator trips for him. No escalator trips yeah. down there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for those of you who don't remember how Donald Trump came down and greeted the media when he yeah. first uh, he announced the president, yeah. and he came four, down the escalator. Four, four years ago, four yeah. years ago, yeah. two yeah. days, yeah. yeah. Four and two days. that way yeah. specifically because of the Simpson episode that shows him doing that so that the Simpson episode isn't so much prophetic as a idea yeah. seed that he applied. An inspiration. You mean Simpson, the uh, cartoon? Yeah. Yep. Well, he followed up and continued to be yeah, a cartoon. Yeah, like a decade no, before that, there's a Simpsons episode where they're joking about Trump uh, being president. Uh, all I'm saying <laughs> is the next candidate comes down the escalator, run away from it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Well, and, Scotty, just to, to go off that, that episode where they joke about Trump being president, what's the big joke? That he's president, he bankrupt the entire country. That's another thing. I'm going to say, just run away from him. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I, we have a packed uh, lineup today. we got Bernie Porn that's going to be joining us uh, about the polling here in the state of Michigan, presidential politics, and, and some of the things that are connected with it. A couple other quick things to hit, and we, we have, um, I know some callers starting to line up. Keith, you wrote an article, that, or an op-ed, they call it technically, uh, talking about as chair of the Black Caucus, but also about uh, you, you alluded to it a little bit about Southern uh, South Carolina and you know coming to uh, or North Carolina where they had the uh, uh, African Americans sort of meet and, and learn issues from some of the presidential candidates or that they're supposed to listen. So why don't you tell us what you wrote so about there? You know, the news didn't pick it up. The free press Detroit didn't news, pick yeah. it up. 
you know, they, they, you know, I didn't send, I didn't send a lot of stuff to those folks, mm. and I got one, one, one editorial back in 2013 talking about the race against my, Mike Duggan and Benny Napoleon. So this time, I went to the Legacy Dinner, and I, li- I listened to all those. Uh, I'm not gonna say all of them were blowhards, but I <laughs> them and they were just one thing after another. The middle class and, you know, uh, the Great Lakes, we up there fighting. That was uh, Gary Peter. We're fighting for you. We're fighting for the Great Lakes and all that other stuff. And they were just going on and on. And I'm saying, I sat there, I said, they're not talking to me. I said, I'm a you small. mean as a black man? As a black man and as a small business guy, it's all, uh, uh, it's all generic stuff they're talking about. Specifically, I'm asking, what are you going to do for me? And talk to my issues. And so I said, they, I said, what are those issues? How about a quality public education with competent and motivated and well-paid teachers, instructionally sound and safe schools, unemployment, and generational poverty, consistently among the highest in the country, it directly related to some uh, crime access to affordable health care, a lack of business formation, and the strategy to reduce the huge wealth gap in the African-American community. Because of these persistent issues, I am tired of hearing what the Democrats are doing for the Great Lakes. With too many in Detroit areas drowning in the sea of poverty, I'm tired of the, of the politicians who claim to represent my community saying one thing when they're seeking votes but doing something else when they are elected to office. I'm tired of he- hearing Democratic politicians, I'm fighting for you, when the evidence of even a minor scuffle on behalf of the black folks who uh, who need the, um, the help most help is nowhere to be seen. So that's what I was talking about, Bob. You know, they're not talking about the issues, uh, you know, that affect African Americans. You know, they want to talk in, you know, um, they want to pick us up while they're talking about the middle class. You, you know, it's interesting what you said one time. I remember a couple of weeks ago. It's uh, and I know climate change is one of those issues that people debate and stuff, in in solar energy, but it's just not climate change we're talking about my roof we're talking about i want a new roof not necessarily one that's going to just uh, have all the climate change uh, adjustments to it just give me the new roof to start with you know it's just when i asked you know when i was talking i said am i asking for too much i'm I'm paying taxes you know i see our schools are crumbling i see the uh, uh, capital formation not coming into our community and i'm saying what is our policies I know that we play Kate to the liberals and the unions and all that other stuff, and I love them dearly. But what about the small business guy who's trying to make a business work, who's, who's got to go through all those regulations and all that other stuff? You know, and it's hard for us to go in business. And then where's the capital to go in business? You know what I'm saying? The loans, the money, the, the banks. The money at the banks and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So, And then there's the, those discriminatory practices you can't get capital, okay, Bob? Any business cannot survive without capital. And so I'm just, I'm tired of the rhetoric about the Democratic Party, but I'm not going anywhere. I love I loved what, what FDR did and all the policies and LBJ, but the bottom line is this. Everybody don't work in a union, a union environment. Everybody's not um, a teacher and all this other stuff. There's some inspiring entrepreneurs just need help, need capital. So Democratic Party... What are you going to do for me? You know, Bob, Um, one of the things that I noticed that uh, I actually uh, agree with Keith, you know, you know, small business owners here in the city of Detroit and throughout Michigan actually needs a lot of help. And one of the things we have done since I took office was, you know, was push and fight crime, grow jobs, you know, with bringing, you know, SBA, Detroit Economic Growth and other people to the table. But we also realize, you know, small business have other issues. They don't have good reporting, you know, as far as uh, financial reporting. You know, they can't afford a CPA. Um, a lot of them don't have an uh, uh, attorney that they can uh, pick up the phone and say, come by, come by the shop, or that they can actually afford. It's a lot of things that small businesses are And you know what really it opens hurting. it up to when Donald Trump says, what yes. have they done for you? Yes, that's right. What do you got to lose by voting for me? I'm going to create an environment where the small business people right. are going to have yeah. have a chance. One but, thing I wanted to, um, I was wondering, I wanted to go back because you're talking about a roof in relation to the, the changing climate. I just got a roof like um, about a year ago, 
and I don't remember the climate being any different on the old roof than on the new one. So how is the climate change causing? <laughs> no, well, you know, but, no, that was a metaphoric yeah, meaning right, that right. you know how you have sun glass and, and you know more sophisticated and solar roofs, panels, solar and, panels uh, and everything but else. What, what I'm talking about, man, you're asking you know, about just I need a new roof. Period. Yeah, yeah, just not, see the bottom line, they, oh, you know, the elaborate stuff. Yeah, but see, but to me, you know, they just they just apprehended the guy was killing all those women. Okay, but look at the look at the problem, Bob. They was going into vacant houses, so why don't they give some cash and put a small developer in there to redo those houses and get those folks a shot? The one, the you know, you get them out of prison, let them get a shot. You know, help build and fix their own house. You know what I'm getting at? Well, one of the one of the issues here in the city of Detroit is you have to you have to eliminate the red tape for small businesses. I mean, there's too many different mm-hmm. checkpoints a local business owner have to go through to do business here in the city, and we need to figure out ways where it's you know it's just not that hard to do business. You know, one of the problem <clears throat> one of the problems is that the lifeblood of small businesses is capital. You need financing banks have to be willing to lend it to you or nonprofits or somebody to give you that grant to initially start and say we think you're going to be successful now most small businesses <coughs> fail a good you know 80% of them fail and and so you know they're willing to take a chance on some of the uh, entrepreneurs and not on others they're saying open up the open up the pool and they have it uh, you know, available for a lot of a lot more people, a lot more uh, people that uh, of color. Yeah, Bob, and what they do in, in our, my community is forces into ghetto economics. It, you, know, you know, and this is what I mean by that. They don't want you. Know, you got a lot of folks. They doing cash, okay? Um, they working out of their homes. They the the the, the father, the grandfather, or the father got a mechanic shop in his in his Back garage. Yeah. And that kind of stuff. And so what you're doing, you 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 bring an unhealthy situation into which should be a prosperous um a, a situation. And I'm saying to my brothers and sisters who got money, let's buy some buildings and put those businesses in buildings and and so they can get a, a tax ID number so they can stop paying some taxes. They don't realize you got to pay taxes because uh, get a, a, you got to pay taxes. So you and you need a financial statement. So if you go buy a, buy a house, you got to know they want to know where their income is coming from. Okay, I don't so, want to make it out to be a black and white issue. No, I'm but, just, oh, but, uh, but 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 one one of the things I one of one of the things I have noticed is you do have a lot of um, individuals in the city of Detroit are looking to um, buy these different properties. The problem is when they go down to K Mac. They having a hard time trying to figure out what some of these buildings who's who owns these these properties. But what I'm saying is, my article is my article is geared for those who have been so loyal to the Democratic Party, and what have we got? You know, I know it's not a black and white issue. I'm talking a direct issue that affects our community. Okay, I can break break it down even yeah. further. African Americans have been loyal supporters of the Democratic Party for a number of decades. Yeah. Okay, a yeah. number of decades. Yeah. And so they turn to the party and they say, okay, what are you going to do for us in an urban area? I, I don't want to bring up a comparison, but one of the comparisons is Benton Harbor. What's going on out yes, there? Yes. Where basically they're going to dilute or eliminate the high school, and, and they're saying we're going to split the districts up and we're going to send the youngsters to Well, right now they might actually look a Democrat. Huh? And they're under the leadership of a Democrat. Well, yeah, but yeah. that's exactly the point that Keith's making, yeah. that, you know, there have been a number of uh, African Americans that have voted Democratic for decades, and yet, uh, w- you know, when it comes to a, an issue that really affects them, I, I guess, and I'm not sure how, uh, we're far away from Benton Harbor, I'm not sure, I mean, I just started catching up reading about it because they're yeah. starting to write about it in the media. But did they did they actually go in and listen to everybody first and then try to make a decision, or did they make the decision that they're trying to defend it now yeah. in, in front of the community to, to do it? Bob, that, that is an uh, actual, just think about it. St. Joe and, uh, and, and Ben Harbor, it really is a tale of two bridges. Tell them what yeah, St. Joseph is very economically yeah. well off. Yeah. Okay, Jerry, John, we're going to get to you right after the ba- break, and then we're going to have some of our guests uh, join us online. Listen, 910 AM Superstation. Are you drowning in debt? Struggling just to make minimum payments? 
it's not your fault. Serious debt can happen to anyone, but there is hope. Our debt-free program has helped thousands of good people just like you eliminate their credit card debt. Call us today and we will dramatically reduce your credit card debt down to just a fraction of what you owe. The call is free. The consultation is free. Take control of your credit debt. Take control of your life again. Call now to see how our debt-free program can work for you. Call 800-872-5230. If you or a loved one underwent hernia surgery between 2010 and 2016 and then suffered serious complications, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Complications associated with FISO-MESH include chronic pain, infection, adhesions, mesh migration, reopening of the hernia, and other serious injuries. Call right now. Call 1-800-799-2091. Again, that's 1-800-799-2091. Attention! In July 2018, Bayer announced that it will be halting its sales of Assure. The Assure birth control may break or migrate after insertion, puncturing the fallopian tube, resulting in corrective surgery to remove the device. Thousands of women have reported debilitating health problems to the FDA. In April 2018, the FDA restricted sales of Assure to protect women and required that patients receive risk information. Please call 800-425-9539. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis, and this is Atomic Beam USA. Another bright idea from Bulbhead, the ultra-bright, tough-grade flashlight that features tactical technology used by U.S. Special Forces. This flashlight has a feeble 125 lux output. The Atomic Beam USA has up to 5,000 lux. That's 40 times more. We're going to drop it hundreds of feet from this helicopter. It hits the tarmac, and it's still working. That's what I call a tough flashlight. Heavy downpours, mud puddles, even extreme temperatures are no match. You could spend over $100, or the Atomic Beam USA can be yours for just $19.99. With free lifetime guarantee. Order now, you can double it and get a second Atomic Beam USA. Just pay a separate fee, and we'll even ship them to you for free. Atomic Beam USA is just $19.99. Order now. Call 1-800-638-2619 to get your Atomic Beam USA. Call now or go to AtomicBeam.com. So call 1-800-638-2619. Deluxe version available. Order now. We all love fried food, but the problem is all that excess oil and fat can cause you to become overweight. Well, now there's the Cook Light Aero Fryer, an amazing kitchen miracle that uses air to fry instead of oil. So you can have the same delicious flavor and crispiness of deep frying using little or no oil. Get that deep fried taste and crispiness with up to 70% fewer calories. Enjoy crispy, delicious fries with little or no oil, guilt-free onion rings, cheesy and delicious mozzarella sticks. Call now and bring the Cook Light Aero Fryer into your home, including the Cook Light Aero Fryer Recipe Book, the unique patented dual tray, air frying mesh basket and tongs, and stainless steel extender ring. You'll get it all for five easy payments of $29.95. Be one of the first 500 callers and get this 13-piece knife set a $175 value, yours free. Try Cook Light Aero Fryer for 30 days. If you don't love it, send it back, but keep the 13-piece knife set as our gift to you. We're in the next 10 minutes and we'll include free shipping. Call now or go online to air2fry.com. That's air2fry.com. This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Because home is more than four walls and a roof. It's that porch swing on a summer night. It's pajamas with feet and everybody over for Sunday dinner. And that old stuffed chair in the living room you just can't get rid of. This is why you work a second job. This is why you learn to fix things yourself so you can save on repairs. Because home is your place, your memories, your family sleeping in their own beds at night. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. And now even more options are available. Call 888-995-HOPE today. That's 888-995-HOPE. Or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. Steven. 
Who said that? Me, down here. <gasps> what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. Well, uh, what are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. Don't you remember me? Don't you know that we miss you? Miss me? Who misses me? You know, all your friends in the forest. The trees, the pond, that little fort that you made out of branches. We all miss you. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. Oh, I guess that makes sense. The forest is not that far away. Have an adventure today. I'm sure your mom would take you. You're right. I should get out. I want to have fun. Play in puddles, catch frogs, and climb trees. Hey, Mom! Yeah, hon? <gasps> Stephen! What is that in your hand? It's my sense of adventure, Mom. It's telling me we need to get out of the house and have some fun in nature today. Come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Crime Stoppers helps solve crime. Hi, this is Dan DiBardino, president of Crime Stoppers of Michigan, asking you to help us continue our work in keeping your neighborhood safe. Each year, more and more families turn to us for help seeking justice for their loved ones. Please help us by donating through our website, 1-800-SPEAK-UP.ORG. Any amount will help us. We are helping families every day, and you can too. Again, the website to donate is 1-800-SPEAK-UP.ORG. We're the hottest station in... Uh, I know, we always say that. Uh, Scotty Bo uh, Bowman, uh, Libertarian. We have a couple callers. We're going to get to you, then we're going to get to our guest, uh, Eric Williams, uh, right around 8.30. Jerry, Jerry, you're on with the panel. Robert Vicano, good morning to your distinguished guests with you, and Thank happy you. Father Day to all of you. You too, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Robert Vicano, uh, as you know... Uh, the state of Israel is the only uh, state in the world, and I do believe the Jewish people have all the right uh, to have their land uh, back to them as uh, God promised in all the holy books, you know, and this is the truth. Um, so I do support the cause of the state of Israel, and they have the right to exist. In the meantime, I do respect the right of the Palestinian uh, to live in peace with the Jewish people. My question here, uh, Mr. Robert, and to your guest, and I would love to see the answer. In one of the show in the same station, 9, 10 a.m., there is a daily radio uh, talk show. And I don't know, Mr. Robert, if you uh, don't mind, is it okay if I mention the name? Yeah, of the I think he's an Arab American at 9 o'clock, Monday through yes, Friday. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, his name, Mr. Amr Zahar. And Mr. Amr Zahar, he mentioned, uh, surrounding to him, that there is a caucus of a Jewish and a caucus of uh, a black African-American here in uh, Greater Detroit. They met together in supportation of the state of Israel. So I did participate, and I talked to him, and I say, why you been criticized uh, the, those two caucuses? He said, yeah, Jay, because they are working against the Palestinian people, against the Arab people. So I told him, why you guys, especially like there is a CARE, which is like an Islamic Arab organization, which you hear about it here and there, why CARE does not reach out to the black caucus, to the Jewish caucus, then would be no problem. Yeah, that, that, a, Jerry, there are organizations that reach over to each other. I, I, um, uh, Tim Attella used to be head of one, believe it or not. He's an Arab American. That uh, They used to have, they called it Bridges. I can't remember. Oh, no, Bridges is a different one. That's actually put on by the U.S. attorney. Oh, you mean Dr. Uh, uh, well, Tim, uh, she, uh, Tim Attella is she, an attorney. He's an activist that uh, I think would reach over. I'll tell you what, Jerry, we have a number of callers. I, I appreciate you yeah, yeah, with that. Yeah, just just my last question to you, uh, Mr. Robert Vicano. Uh, did the caucus, uh, Jewish caucus, the black caucus, does not reach to the Arab or the Arab does not reach to them? That you know, was my question. Something? I'm in the black caucus. We reach out to everybody. I don't know where they get that from. Okay. I got majority. Of my, I got a lot of friends uh, that that are Arab, that are, you know, an Arab descent. And, you know, I don't. We, I'm not getting into that, you know, because I'm not trying to find no divisive issues this morning. But uh, we do reach out to um, the Arab community. 
Gary, we appreciate it. We got a couple more uh, calls before our guest here. You too, Jerry. We appreciate you listening. Yeah, one God. thing I would say about the whole um, Israeli Arab American relations and all this um, is that the United States needs to stop trying to run their countries to start stop trying to just pick winners and losers over in the Middle East to stop um, sending billions of dollars well, the, over the pro- to those problem countries. problem you have with that is the oil is uh, <laughs> so uh, important to. Uh, all the economies that they're not going to stick their nose out of it. That's, I mean, uh, so much of their policy is oil driven. I mean, in terms of to make sure that it continues on uh, one way, I'm not saying it's fair or unfair. They're just the United States interest many times has to do with the petroleum. Well, they need customers. They and so yeah, must be able to buy it. Yeah. Last, uh, John, before our, uh, our guest, Eric Williams, John, you're on with the panel here. Well, happy Father's Day. Hey, oh, Steve, I, you're off. My a man. residential postal worker. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, check this out, Keith. I was thinking, your big businesses, the Democrats, they go after big businesses, they demonize them, and they turn around, they, they take their money and create more government programs. So, therefore, that hurts a small business owner that they go in their cash-only business saying, why should I create a business if I can go cash-only and avoid the taxes? And it falls in the same line of a Dan, Dan, you seem to ignore that the businesses take a lot of money, too, don't they, in all the tax credits yeah, and yeah, stuff? Come on. <laughs> well, well, they have to. They keep people employed. But on the same thing, what if you got the, the, the Democrats like these government programs. No, not for the, the Republican Party like they're government they're programs, too. <laughs> With, you know what the government program is? You know what the, hey, John, you know what the government program is? Tax cuts. <laughs> You're both right. <laughs> If you turn around and, and you get some government assistance, they can go. Hey, John, John, a guy, guy like me and you. The government allows you. They kick you off. Hey, J- John, a guy like me and you. We, we you know, no more than you, more so you, because you've been living off the government a mighty, mighty long time <laughs> <laughs> through the military, hey, through hey, the hey, post hey, hey, office. Hey, I have it. I I just started. I just started working with the county about six hey. years ago. Hey, Keith, I'm telling you, the post office is working itself into bankruptcy. Wait till we come and hit you for a tax. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Like the big tree. John, you, okay, John, you have a, a great Father's Day. Happy okay? Father's Day. You too. Yeah, too. Yeah. Thanks, hey, John. Keith. Trump, Trump, you got a little Trump in you, Keith. Not one day. I, I told somebody this. That's why I told somebody. I said, that if I ever see another person going down the escalator, I'm taking a baseball bat at him. No. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. We have on our uh, uh, show today uh, Eric Williams, who's a guest, uh, and one of the issues that has come up quite a bit is uh, facial recognition, and it's a controversy within the city of Detroit and other areas. Eric is with uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, has uh, been on our show uh, two or three times on different things. I know Keith brought him on with about some of the uh, redevelopment downtown and in some of the other areas. So, uh, Eric, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. And good morning to everybody. And uh, happy, again, happy Father's Day to everyone. So, you Eric, too, Eric. you're in the facial recognition now? <laughs> I'm, I'm, into ev- I'm into everything. <laughs> Uh, well, tell us. Tell I know ACLU has a, an issue with the facial recognition going on. Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy about it, about how accurate it actually is, uh, in in what it does. Female, we just heard uh, Elena when she was walking out of the studio heard that you were going to come on and said, "Well, uh, you know, they talk about the females aren't recognized as easily as uh, males, and there's a lot of mistakes that are usually made with it. If we all put on." Uh, Donald Trump masks. I don't know. I'm not sure what it would do at that point. Well, and also I think it's important for people to note that this is something that we've got in the city of Detroit right now. That Project Greenlight, when we're talking about Project Greenlight, there is also a facial recognition component to it. So when you're hearing folks talk about how we want to expand Project Greenlight, we want to put Project Greenlight in every street corner, on every traffic light, that's an expansion of not just a, a traffic surveillance program, but an expansion of a facial recognition program, too. There was a Board of Police Commissioners meeting this past Thursday where, uh, uh, Willie, I, I just want to be honest, I think you got disrespected by the chair. Uh, you were trying to ask some really good questions uh, of the department about their policies relating to facial recognition, and you got shut down. You got prevented from doing your duty as an elected official. So I just want to make sure that, that people knew that, that you were trying to ask some questions about right, this. And I, and I noticed that as well. Um, the, the, uh, um, Commissioner Bell kept um, – 
interrupting Willie and um, trying not to let him speak. And um, by the way, it was it was section um, so did you three o. I'm sorry, I'm pulling up something here. Three o seven point six, directive three o seven point six that was discussed there. And what I had pointed out was that um, the directive does not deal with the fact that. Um, this technology is in the cameras and can be turned on. It simply deals with how it's used. And so the capabilities there, and it's easy to flip the switch, um, you know, ideologically and just say we're going to reestablish a different policy and it's already locked in. You know, one right. of the, and I, no, what I was going to say is, um, again, at that meeting last night, um, they were talking about uh, the policy. And there, there are two ways you should know that this is a problem. One is, uh, and this was mentioned at the meeting, the people that have cut, that came up with this, Silicon Valley out, out in San Francisco, they outlawed it, the police using it in their own city. All right, so that really ought to be the first thing to make us pay attention. And the second thing is, they, and they've I, outlawed it in I, San Francisco. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. They have, but we can't use it. So, um, and the second thing is, we had um, a, a assistant chief uh, White up there and was describing the policy. And I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he, he unintentionally, um, incorrectly described the policy. Uh, but he got up there and he said, and you see this on the news a lot, this is for murderers and this is for rapists and that's how we're going to use this. This policy that they had up there doesn't, doesn't restrict it to that. I mean, literally, what the, they can use facial recognition technology under circumstances where the police couldn't even lawfully stop you and, like, ask to see ID or, or frisk you. I mean, it is such a loose standard that they have. It's a joke, and it absolutely says nothing about whether or not what they see can be shared with um, the IRS or FBI or Homeland Security or any other, or the Michigan State Police, any other law enforcement agency. It doesn't address that at all. So... I mean, so there are tons of problems, and I could literally talk five hours on the practical and civil rights problems with Eric. Uh, so uh, just, just to... won't, but the but the fact that they literally are lying to us and hiding stuff ought to be enough for us to really take a close look at what's going on. Eric, just to understand it. So you're saying the facial recognition um, policy uh, more or less triggers a probable cause them to start going after some, or to at least stop someone and talk to them and ask them for identification, basically? Okay, so you, under, I mean, so I know that you understand what a reasonable suspicion is, right? Yeah, right. And it's basically there has to be an articulable, you know, an articulable reason that they're basically... Believe that there's some type of, of yeah, crime going on. And that yeah. this person is involved in it, right? Yes. This says that there's a reasonable suspicion that using facial recognition technology will be relevant to an active or ongoing criminal uh, or homeland security investigation. Okay, it has nothing to do with whether or not it's relevant to that person, whether or not there's a crime afoot right there. And use in, and by based on that standard, the police can literally use or allow another law enforcement agency to use these cameras to follow someone around the city. Attorney, so attorney, gonna... attorney Eric Williams, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm glad you, you raised that point. But one of the things I've been wanting to see uh, was a draft policy or, rev or a revised policy or what is the actual policy. I have not seen either. And I don't even know how many pages is this policy happens to be. Can, do you well, have... I have a copy of it. And the part that deals with facial recognition itself is two sentences long. Wow. It's two sentences. No, so, and that, that's all the protection that they want to give us as far as their use for it. So, Eric, if, if I'm if I'm a head of Homeland Security on the federal level and uh, my department contacts Detroit PD and says there's a federal investigation of Homeland Security, we're concerned about some issues in the Detroit area, at that right. point I can plug into the facial recognition? Yes. <laughs> they, okay. they have they can use any stream i mean there's no reason why they can't come in and, and look at any stream that's coming from any camera if they want to i don't think people realize the infrastructure that we are building into in detroit between the cameras and the facial recognition technology is 
is really extreme because it's like building a road. Once you build a road, what goes on that road, what gets built on that road is completely different. But once you've built the road, you, you've laid the track. You can't unring this bell, right? Now, we're not even factoring in artificial, uh, um, you know, we haven't even factored in AI yet, right? And once you have artificial intelligence on this, they will literally be able to just watch cameras and see who's doing what. There's actually a pretty good story in the New York Times today that talks about how artificial intelligence will be able to tell what people are doing, that the cameras will be able to pick up on what people are reading and pull things from the text to see whether or not it's something the police should investigate. So they, you, can they read their cell phones? Can they read their cell phones, you're saying? Oh, yeah, that's they, been around already. Uh, no, I mean from exactly. the uh, from the cameras from from that from depends the, on resolution. From the traffic monitor camera, yeah, from the traffic monitor cameras, it's not it's not clear. But that's another thing we don't know any of the capabilities here. And once you build in the infrastructure, I guarantee you, you're not going to be able to stop them. When have we ever been able to trust the government with with surveillance? Well, I think you you also hit hit a good point. What's the oversight? Is there anything that talks about who who can review this? Is is there any way that that the government or the courts can can review what's being done with this and, and have some form of control over the government. Well, see, this is the problem. Um, so there there has been there have been a number of cases that have gone to police surveillance. And when people talk about you know you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, the Supreme Court has actually said, and recently said in a, in a case versus uh, U.S. versus Carpenter that. The what is a reasonable expectation of privacy is you don't completely give it up when you go out in the open. So, for example, the police don't have a right to know where you're going every single moment of the day or where you've been every moment of the day just because you've done it out in public, right? So the police can't just follow you around, right? right? Uh, like that. Uh, so, uh, they, so the police couldn't just get your cell phone record to see where you've been all day without a warrant. Like well, they that. they were doing that for a while, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, bad old days before the police commission. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, I mean nationally, right. they were they were getting everybody's cell. Phone. They went to the telephone company or the cellular fo- uh, phone companies, and they were able to get, uh, I believe, all your calls and stuff. Well, yeah, sure and that program going on, yeah. and that program was leaked by Edward Snowden, who yeah. is a contractor working for the NSA. Think about the contractors who'd be working on this project for the Detroit Police Department and all these other cities, right? The Amazons, like, like Eric, you said, the Silicon Valley contractors are going to have access to really valuable, really personal data. What if they leak it? But, but another question is, I, one of the questions I wanted to raise, and that's a good point, um, um, Tom, that you just brought up too, because what happens um, when, you know, you look at the police department, who in the department has access to this to the data that's collected and what outside companies is also going to have uh, access to this as well. And I'm glad you brought up the whole uh, Edward Snowden situation because that was real. That did take place. That's no fiction about that. And let's give, let me give you something it's else real. that took place. Do you remember in Baltimore the protest over the death of Freddie Gray? Yes. The police used facial recognition technology and cameras of the protest and went and picked up people at the protest who had outstanding warrants. Well, look what happened in look what happened in in New York. You had a a student. We talking about a student, right? Um, was you know facial recognition caused a, a wrongful arrest, and now he's suing Apple for a billion dollars. I mean, it we, people, we need people to wake up about this whole facial facial recognition. You know, it was just not long ago the the FBI was using it as a pilot. Well, where it's really taken off, and I don't think people have even recognized it, is uh, China. China has instituting it uh, completely to control any dissidents. They're probably uh, now they're, it looks like they're going to expand it to Hong Kong uh, with, yeah. all, with all the unrest that they're having there. But China and, has been way ahead. And if you want to see what it looks yeah, like in the future, they actually uh, tap into everything uh, with facial recognition and, and what they're trying to do to control their citizens because – Let's face it, their conflict is they want to have a capitalistic system, but they don't want uh, the democracy that comes with it. They want, you know, the pure form of communism in terms of being able to run the government. And that causes a lot of dissent. I mean, historically, it has always caused dissent. 
and they're implementing it in order to control their citizens. And selling but, it, too. Eric, Eric, you know, we talk on these radio shows, and, and I, I bet you nine times out of ten, nobody's understanding what are we talking about. What is facial recognition? You know, and, you know, a lot of just yeah. that's, uh, just a very simple question. Uh, what is? I think people know what facial recognition. Is. Well, <laughs> no, Eric, no, Eric, no, Eric, no. Eric, go ahead. Well, go ahead. So, facial facial recognition technology basically is uses um, software to capture specific aspects of a person's face, their images, like eyes, nose, and then compares them to faces in a database. So, in Michigan, the Michigan State Police have a database that contains every single person who has a driver's license or a state ID. It also contains anybody who's been picked up and um, who's been convicted of a crime and faces of people who've been caught up in investigations whether or not they were convicted of a crime. So it's comparing your face to that database. The technology also allows you to create a database of people who are people of interest. So you can create a database from anywhere. But it's being using artificial intelligence and cameras to compare the faces that you see through the cameras uh, to faces in a database. Now, this creates a number of problems because black faces are more likely to end up in any police database than white faces, just simply because of the way our criminal justice system works. Right. So if your database is skewed, right, if your database already includes too many black people as compared to white people, you're going to keep looking for white people, for black people, and then you're going to end up putting more black people in the database. And on top of that, because of the way the technology works, and it isn't perfect, there's only like a 4% error on white men, but there's like a 20% error rate when you're dealing with black women, right? So it's just because, all, because the individuals who used it and tested it are white, all right, it's that's the bias that's already built into the system. But that's how facial recognition technology actually works. Now, you know, how no, does that error rate compare to um, non, I mean, a, a natural intelligence versus artificial intelligence facial recognition where um, people are looking at photos and trying to identify and say, oh, yeah, that's the same guy, that's the same woman, that isn't the same person. How does that compare? Well, they do that in show-ups and things like that. You're talking about in, uh, in police. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, and that's the thing. There's actually a there's an, a bias there, right? I mean, so to be perfectly honest, the number one factor in unlaw in wrongful conviction is eyewitness identification. Yeah. Let's get to some of the callers, if you don't mind, here, Eric. Um, Rick, Rick, you're on with uh, Eric Williams. Rick. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, interest- Interesting conversation, the piece with the facial recognition. For me, my interest is around how we organize resistance to this type of data intrusion, right? Because your guest is alluding to something that comes into play, and that's the trust triggers. Just like you said, Keith, a lot of people may not understand the concept of how facial recognition can be regulated by them, but they understand things like conspiracies, right? So the people who generally are needed to mobilize a lot of this foundation are those people with a history of of dealing with either the conspiracy theories or people with a history of, you know, exposing things with the government, just as we've seen with getting information out about, you know, uh, the measles and, and, and things like that, inoculations and such. And so the problem for me gets to be when tech people explain, or not meaning that you're a techie, but when people from that end of the community come out and bring up something like facial recognition and they don't have a long attachment with public advocacy for the safety or, you know, for the advancement of citizens on any other front, it tends to slow up how fast we can get organized to do anything effective. Rick, uh, Rick, all you got to think about is when you talk about facial recognition, if you have a new iPhone, they all open up by recognizing your face. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I mean, and just think of that database. I mean, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, my phone's relatively new. So, I mean, it, uh, it, uh, you know, if I show my face, it opens up uh, in there. And I think all the new... That's an enormous database of which people can start to right. will be fed and, into. And, but, 
But here's the greater point. They believe that they have the right to tap into the facial recognition data just like they rolled up on point-of-sale data, right? So in the industries of the people taking this stuff up, they can see that as part of the process. You know, uh, we did it at point-of-sales. We got all of that data. Heck, we can do facial recognition. We can get all of that data. They're never going to stop you know, because they they have incentives to drive forward. That's why, you know, we need things like Make3.com. You, the, okay. The okay, yeah, okay. okay. Well, we understand. Okay, we understand. The individual has, the individual's input has no redress unless it's accounted for. Okay. And if nobody is counting it, it is not accounted for. That's my point about this organizing here and the trust triggers. This is a real issue, but I bet you couldn't get 500 people to come out with any level of commitment to this issue, right? Okay. You know, I think if people could protest this, what if, like, on November 5th, everyone wore a Guy Fawkes mask for the whole day? <laughs> they wouldn't know where anyone was, what anyone was doing. It would I, be I, totally I'd lean towards the Donald Trump mask. Okay, uh, Rick, too. we appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. One, one, you're on with uh, Eric Williams. How are you gentlemen doing? Good. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you too, one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it is, it's, this whole subject is just, it's just so many layers of controversial issues with it. You know, from um, the, inst- the, the funding, the installation, the habits, who's handling it, who manufactured the technology, who's going to be in control of it. Are these people, you know, with, with how technology is being infiltrated these days from um, offshores, and I mean, why are we putting all these joysticks in these people's hands? And who, and I mean, you know, we can say that the mayor and the city council, whoever wants it, but Who's manufacturing? Who's controlling it? You know, I think Wayne State has a big, I heard them on the 9, 10, a couple of years ago, speaking on their camera system, how elaborate it was. And if you were MGM, I, you pull out $100, I can tell, I can see somebody crossing the Ambassador Bridge. So, you know, and then I think Dan Gilbert has a number of cameras downtown. Real quick, but can we, has anybody done any independent studies on those? You see what I'm saying? And like I'm like, where is this technology coming from? Who's manufacturing it? Who's gonna be handling it? Because they have issues now with the Facebooks and all of them. The people who are handling the data are using it to their advantages, yeah, well, selling it off and things of that nature. Yeah, fa- if Facebook, Zuckerberg, and the rest of them have not really shown that uh, they're willing to. Uh, 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 yeah, I don't want to just put that joystick in anyone's hand. I'm yeah. sorry. And, uh, too, uh, Eric, you might be able to correct me on this. I thought that Detroit Police Department's mm-hmm. contract was with Amazon for the technology, wasn't it? Uh, yes, uh, and it's called, like, recognition. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, it, go it, ahead, Eric. It, it, it is with, it's with Amazon, I believe, or it might be Microsoft, but it's one of the two companies. Um it's L, it's a uh, DataWorks is actually is the company who's is the major company they're using, but DataWorks itself is using um, a program that contains stuff from uh, I believe I believe it might be Microsoft, but I'm not 100 okay, percent sure. Okay. But still, all these big tech companies, you know, the ones that are going that are under scrutiny right now. I think I saw something that did say uh, DataWorks, but one of the things that I want to say that. You know, um, note that um, facial recognition have not been properly tested in the black and brown communities. And uh, and that Detroiters spoke very loudly um, Thursday at the Detroit Border Police Commission saying that they don't want it. Eric, if you if you could uh, if the ACLU could devise the perfect policy, what would it be? Well, there wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be facial recognition technology. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's <laughs> well. Let's true. let's say that the uh, let's say that the national uh, concerns would would override that and say we got to have some type of facial recognition. How, what would be the best policy? Do you think? Um. Well, I, I mean, it would be one that would definitely be. It would have to be open. We would have to know when it was being used, and, we, and it would have to. It would and it would have to. Um, be compliant with what our constitutional rights are, right? Because the problem is, 
this, the police can violate your constitutional rights, and unless the person yeah, actually knows it. against it, and yeah, unless the person knows it, and half the time you don't even find this out in a criminal setting, and then has the finances and ability to appeal it repeatedly, the fact that they're breaking the law is never going to come into play. But I, I also want to challenge your initial premise, which is that this is necessary, right? Um, so, and, and so, and I have to say that we start talking about, for example, terrorism. Okay, I, I am a native Detroiter. I grew up on the West Side, but I lived for 15 years in New York. I happen to have been at the World Trade Center on 9/11. I walked home over the Brooklyn Bridge covered with dust. So I am really, I am very conscious of what terrorism looks like in America looks like, right? But despite my concern about that kind of thing, what we are doing doesn't keep us safer, right? It's None of these things are being proposed as a way to, particularly the way it's being used now, none of this stuff is being proposed as a way to stop crime, but as a way to uh, be able to identify people after a crime has taken place. Okay. Right? And, so, and I understand that. I think the place where it really would open up, in theory, I don't know if this would, how this would happen, is that if the federal government gives a... Uh, FISA warrant, and and they think that the, there's something amiss in Detroit, and they get a FISA warrant, warrant, which means it's going to be secret. They go to Detroit PD and they plug in. You're saying for transparency, you probably never find out unless that you know somehow that FISA warrant, FISA warrant ever got out. Which, according to listening to this, they could they could plug into at this point. I'm wondering what what is the objection for only using it like for if you're searching um, crime photos versus um, a database of people who have been arrested or convicted of crimes and like you would APHIS or CODIS. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't I couldn't quite hear your question. What if you limited the database to those that have been convicted of crimes? Yeah, and then require a um, an actual you know eyeball check on things before proceeding. Well, well, considering the fact that, you know, the number of false convictions we have and the number of people who plead guilty just because they've been threatened with, you know, incredibly long sentences for something, uh, I think you're just reinforcing a built-in bias that already exists. How many people okay. plead guilty simply because they don't want to take a chance going, uh, going to trial? Which also leads to the uh, whole bail bonds thing that uh, I know you're uh, supportive of in the ACLU, but... Eric, I want to thank you. Yeah. We're at the end of the hour here. It's a fascinating subject. Appreciate you coming yeah. in. And I think we're going to try to have some form of a town hall. I definitely want to work uh, with, with Willie if you'd be interested in helping out a town hall to get more voices out on the subject. Okay. Eric, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Okay. All right. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Happy Father's Day. To help your problems or help you smile about it by finding a way to solve them. This is Reverend Shopton, and on the last Keeping It Real with Reverend Al Shopton. Oh, I just yeah. don't count the votes. They're not there with the vote. They just get I just votes. answered you That's before, right. sir, that yeah. I know thousands of people that are in the rooms when the votes come in. Every candidate has people in the room. When I've run, I have people in the room. Everybody running is going to have people in the room when the count comes in. The question is making sure we get the right count. The count does not come from them counting ballots. The count comes through technology. This is not 1890. We're not having people at the courthouse standing in line or the schoolhouse and you see the ballot. The question is making sure you have the right voting companies that they're not hacked or not in any way eliminated. You could have everybody in the world in the room. They will be in the room getting the wrong numbers. So keep it real daily with me, Al Shopton. I knew I could get myself out of this. I just needed some hope and some help. I took the first step to recovery when I made the call. Since 2014, Addiction Hope and Helpline has answered calls for recovery and treatment 24-7, 365 days a year. If you're depressed, drinking, using drugs, or taking pills, call now and talk to someone who cares. 
I had problems just getting to sleep, drinking and using pills every night. I feel like I'm losing control. I'm afraid I'll lose my job or even my family. Most insurance covers substance abuse. You can get back on track. Call now for hope and help with proven gentle recovery programs. I never thought that I could be somebody who didn't drink and use drugs. I have something to hold on to for strength. I'm in recovery, getting the help I need. Call 800-379-4799, 800-379-4799. The day you lose your strength is the day you lose your independence. Muscle is lost with age, affecting your energy, balance, and mobility. Before you know it, you're depending on others just to get through the day. But you can reverse and prevent muscle loss. Introducing MyoHealth, a revolutionary proven approach to increased muscle strength and function in as little as 30 days. Live life on your terms with more energy and confidence. After a serious health issue put me down, MyoHealth's getting me back up again. I'm doing activities that I haven't done for a long time. It really works. MyoHealth is a safe, natural dietary supplement. The result of decades of research and 24 human clinical studies. You can live stronger at any age with greater strength, mobility, balance, and energy. Call or go online now and take the MyoHealth 30-Day Strength Challenge. Listen up, America. Are you or a loved one suffering with an addiction to alcohol, opiates, prescription painkillers, or other drugs? There is hope. Medication-assisted treatment is proven most effective for opiate addiction recovery. Utilizing medications such as methadone, suboxone, and subutex, combined with inpatient treatment, you can achieve lasting recovery. Most insurance is accepted, so call us now. Please call 800-625-5860. Three, You're listening to 910 AM Superstation. The most powerful voices in the African-American community are all right here on the new 910 AM radio superstation. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit. 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation. You can join us at 313-778-7600. That's 313-778-7600. Uh, we have uh, Tom uh, Cholsky, who is the uh, community activist. Of uh, resident Michigan. caterer now, I believe, is my official yeah, term. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. He brought in the donuts this morning, so we appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, Willie Burton, who's a police commissioner. Keith Williams, always opinionated with the uh, Michigan <laughs> Democratic Black Caucus. And our resident libertarian, <laughs> who hasn't got too much of a word in lately because it's been all Democratic politics. Here, uh, Scotty Bowman. Good but, morning, Southeast Michigan. Yes. <laughs> we have with us, though, uh, an individual who I've deeply respected in terms of polling, has done a number of them over the years, uh, Bernie Porn with uh, Epic uh, MRA. Uh, and they've just recently did a Michigan poll about uh, the Trumpster and how's he uh, standing here in Michigan and some of the issues probably that are going to be affecting Michiganders when we're starting uh, to vote. Uh, uh, and it's a, a little bit more particular, too, here in Detroit, because July they're going to have the debates that are actually going to be hosted by the city of Detroit that's going to be here. So, Bernie, Bernie, welcome, welcome to the show. Glad to be with you. How are you, Bob? Great, great, great. Bernie, tell us a little bit about the poll. And uh, I'm of the opinion, and I'll just say it up front, that no matter what people think of Donald Trump or any of the other 20 candidates for the, on the Democratic side, it seems like everybody's opinion is pretty well baked in, and I don't know how you change anybody's opinion at this point about Donald Trump, which makes it, I think, a difficult road for him. But what's your polling tell us? Well, uh, it, it continues to show that he has, will have uh, difficulty getting reelected. Uh, uh, this poll shows that uh, 40% uh, have a favorable opinion of him, 54% an unfavorable opinion, and that is virtually unchanged from uh, our March survey. Uh, and uh, 
when you ask about his job rating, a 57% majority uh, has a have a fav, have a negative job rating uh, for him, and 41% positive job rating, and that's uh, uh, only one point better than it was in March. And then when you uh, ask people if uh, they will vote to reelect him or consider someone else or vote to replace Trump, uh, 32%, only 32% said that they would vote to reelect Trump. And when you think about the fact that 40% self-identified as Republicans in Michigan, uh, that's an eight-point uh, gap for him in terms of uh, losing support among Republicans. And 45% uh, uh, said they would vote to replace Trump. And that same question was asked in March, and it was 49% vote to replace and uh, uh, a few points less in terms of consider voting for someone else, and it was 31% vote to re-elect Trump. And we also included a matchup with uh, Joe Biden, and uh, uh, Biden leads 52 to 41% in Michigan. We uh, uh, did uh, do a, uh, a matchup between Biden and Trump on the day that he skipped the correspondence dinner about a year ago and was giving a speech in Washington Township. The poll began when he uh, started giving his speech uh, uh, on that day, and in that poll it was 52 to 39 percent. So you're right, uh, they are kind of baked in, and, uh, and it's hard to imagine uh, what he is going to be able to say and do uh, to change the minds of uh, uh, a lot of voters in Michigan, especially uh, women. Uh, there is a, a gap among Republican uh, uh, women and men. Uh, re all Republicans, 83 uh, percent, are voting uh, for Trump. 93 percent of Democrats are voting for Biden, and Biden leads among independents, uh, 48 uh, uh, to 36 percent. But there is a a much lower percentage of uh, uh, Republican women who are supporting uh, Trump. Uh, it is 78 percent of Republican women voting for Trump over Biden, while 86 percent of Democratic or Republican men are supporting uh, Trump. So there is a, a huge gap there, and uh, I think from the time of the Access Hollywood uh, tapes. Uh, to uh, the present, uh, and what we saw in the 2018 election, women are very, very motivated to participate, as evidenced by the, the large number of women elected to Congress, and uh, clearly uh, uh, women participating in, uh, uh, in the election process, and, and particularly African-American women. I'm African -American. Wondering, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious about how... Um, the Democratic contenders that you had um, mentioned earlier um, would would do facing off against, say, um, Bill Weld or Justin Amash instead. Would would then the Republican do better or worse than Trump would have against them? Well, uh, Trump still gets the support of uh, of a, a strong number of Republicans. Uh, uh, in the, in the, even at two thirds, it will be difficult. It would be difficult for others to compete against him. And uh, there was a poll released not too long ago uh, in the last week or so uh, after Justin Amash announced his uh, intentions to support impeachment where uh, Lohr, uh, the candidate who is one of the two candidates that are running against him in his district, would lead Justin Amash. That was only one poll, and I believe it was an automated poll, so I'm not sure about the, mm -hmm. about the results of that, but uh, uh, th that was one poll that came out after his announcement, and, uh, and I would not be surprised if, uh, if Trump has enough support to create problems for Justin Amash, and he will, I think, uh, be able to win in a Republican primary uh, over anyone that uh, may... Uh, uh, become more visible in their efforts to try and oppose them. So, Bernie, what is Donald Trump's problem? <laughs> Based well, on your polling information, is it you know the perception of uh, the the Mueller, the Mueller stuff, or what is it? Like the, the people just just don't like him. I think they just don't like him, and <laughs> and his, his biggest problem is that uh, uh, you know I know. Whenever I know whenever he's going to lie, and it's really easy to tell. Yeah. <laughs> when his lips move. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's lying about something. And uh, after, 
after a while, everybody, I think, realizes that. And I've talked to people who even still would say that they would vote for him. And I said, well, what about his lies? And what about this? And what about that? And they yeah, well, I know, I know. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, he's doing what's right for America, or he's doing something else, and you know, point out other issues. Uh, you know, I'm, I am surprised uh, uh, that uh, there aren't more uh, opponents of Trump that are talking about the T word, which he likes to use flippantly, about uh, con accusing people of treason. Well, if in fact he has been talking to uh, to Vladimir Putin, and he's been talking to uh, Kim Jong Un and and uh, flattering them and supporting them with his with his words and and deeds, you know that kind of sounds like treason to me. <laughs> and uh, 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 when you uh, uh, think of the way he treats dictators, I mean, he is clearly a dictator wannabe. Mm -hmm. Now, does, he, uh, does it matter? Uh, he, uh, yeah. He, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, he, he definitely uh, has this uh, authoritarian uh, streak in him that he wants to run everything. Yeah. And he admires the strongmen, uh, uh, you know, across the uh, across the world, is uh, he seems to uh, to hold him in high esteem. But who is the best Democratic candidate to take him on? Do you think, uh, Bernie? Well, uh, I know that uh, there are many progressives running, and because of the sheer number of progressives, why well, I think that someone in a more moderate sense, uh, someone like a Joe Biden, in the end, will still probably be favored. Uh, but a lot of that depends on. How, how many of the progressive candidates uh, peel away, don't have enough money, and uh, where it comes down in terms of the folks that are finally competing for the nomination uh, you know, after halfway through the process. I think that will uh, have a lot to do with uh, who becomes the nominee. And many of those uh, uh, candidates are indeed impressive, but there are so many progressives, especially ones who support Medicare for All, uh, they support uh, other uh, very progressive positions on issues. Uh, and when you look at historically how progressives have fared in marginal competitive districts, while uh, Ocasio-Cortez uh, speaks very brilliantly on a number of issues, she represents her district. And in many respects, uh, a more moderate candidate uh, usually is elected in those districts where uh, it is competitive in general elections. Now, that's not to say that uh, that uh, Bernie Sanders can't win the uh, nomination. Someone I've been very, very impressed with is uh, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Uh, uh, it just, I have been surprised at his ability to uh, uh, converse on just about any issue that he's asked about. But not not uh, real specific, and uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, 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 you know, all, all of them, I think, uh, uh, make a uh, pretty good presentation as candidates. Bernie, but you know what the problem with the ones you just named? They're not connecting with African Americans, and, and that's where the problem lies with Budokrad, Elizabeth Warren, and Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders. They're not connecting. So now, all of a sudden, now, they are, they, I heard Budokrad talking about he's getting his African-American people together and all this other stuff. You know, when I talked earlier in the show, you, you had if you was going to run five years ago, you should have been hanging out with us anyway, okay? <laughs> so now, all of a sudden, you want to hang out with us, okay? Well, you know, I, also... I, I think that it's wrong for Democrats uh, to uh, wait until the last two weekends before an election to uh, visit the churches <laughs> yes, in the yeah, American yes. community. You know, yes. I've always, uh, throughout my career, always encouraged, uh, uh, because of the importance of the African-American community to the Democratic base, to uh, uh, talk about uh, their issues and also uh, uh, approach them uh, much longer than uh, the last couple weekends before the election. And also, I think, uh, in terms of issues, whether it's... Uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren or, or any of the other candidates, <clears throat> they need to really talk about how Republicans have been trying to suppress the uh, the black vote throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you, you raise is, a real uh, good point about that, Bernie. I don't I don't know if you saw it yesterday. The Wall Street Journal had like I don't know they got it inside in uh, inside um, inside of Trump's uh, campaign and the uh, 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 the Republican National Committee 
And they talked about, they, they, and they said, look, we don't think we're going to change many minds, uh, you know, come 2020. What they want to do is suppress the Democratic vote and make sure they got a machine that's going to push out his vote. That's what they're concentrating on is to push out his vote and try to suppress the, the other ones because they said we're not going to change many minds uh, in this. Well, I mean, they're, everything's they're right. baked and, in. Uh, yeah. they're, they're absolutely right. And uh, uh, to, uh, uh, well, one great example is how they're trying to uh, put uh, a, uh, a census question that would ask, ask about uh, – uh, whether or not you're a citizen or not. Uh, that is intended as evidenced by their own uh, Republican strategist who has passed away uh, who uh, said that this will uh, benefit Republicans. I used to, uh, when I worked in the legislature and I uh, 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 debated Republicans on issues, I used to have uh, these uh, coffee cups that I would uh, pass out to them that said, all I want out of life is an unfair advantage. <laughs> and, uh, and, well, uh, and, I, and I think that applies today more than when I passed them out. <laughs> now, Bernie, I, I had a question for you. You mentioned some of the, the numbers that Trump's facing, and you know we see that they, they know that they're not going to convince a lot of people. Could you give us some context? How do these numbers stack up to like what we saw in 2018, like how unfavorable Republicans were, or 2016, or even 2012 where President Obama was reelected? Like are we seeing favorable, unfavorables? Is, is Trump more unfavorable? than we've seen in the past? Is this, you know, just kind of a, a par for a, a president reelect? Well, I think it uh, varies somewhat uh, depending on what he's doing and what he's talking about and the actions that he takes. Uh, when he does something that's really outlandish, well, he'll drop a few points. Uh, when he does something that uh, is a little bit more favorable to uh, the, the, the general population, which uh, is only about uh, maybe a tenth to a quarter of the time, why uh, sometimes his numbers will improve, but not all that much, and certainly not among independent voters. It will usually uh, vary among Republicans. Uh, Republican women may be a little bit more supportive when he does something that they like, but uh, for the most part, they're pretty static. They don't uh, move all that much. Bernie, they're, uh, they're doing a focus group uh, Monday, I think Chris Matthews, in Dayton, Ohio, okay? Those folks in 2012-2016 voted for Barack Obama. And you can't call them racist because they did vote for the brother, okay? But they're now sticking with Donald Trump. So what is that about? Well, I think that uh, uh, for some reason there's a lot of, uh, of uh, 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 voters who, uh, who think that, uh, uh, that Donald Trump is uh, – is uh, helping them on, on their issues. Immigration comes into play, and uh, it. Uh, I, I wish I could remember the uh, uh, the quote from uh, 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 Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he was asked once why uh, uh, some uh, voters uh, vote uh, uh, the way they do, and he said uh, when. Uh, and I, and I, I'm really messing it up here, but uh, he said that uh, when you. Uh, uh, take a, uh, 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 a, a a black man, uh, a, a white voter will uh, will uh, try to uh, uh, take advantage of them, and uh, the Republicans will uh, uh, demonize them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, I can't remember the uh, the quote, but it was a great quote, and he said, uh, uh, and uh, they'll even take take the money out of their pocket, uh, uh, their own pocket, uh, to give. Uh, to a candidate who is doing things that are against their own interest. And uh, when you think about some of the uh, folks who have demonstrated uh, uh, for uh, Trump, uh, they say, don't take my Medicare away, don't take uh, uh, my Social Security away, and uh, at the same time they're in favor of Trump. Well, what do you think he's trying to do? <laughs> Tom, uh, let, let's get Tom in here before we go to break. Tom, you had a question for uh, uh, Bernie Porn? Well, not a question, but I got a, you know, kind of somewhat of a statement. I mean, my candidate right now is Joe Biden, okay? Joe Biden, he, was, he served President Obama very admirably. And he was a heartbeat away from sitting in the most powerful seat in this world, okay? Um, and, but, you know, when you look at number 45, I mean, come on, anybody, and I'm talking about politically right now, anybody who would support him and this one candidate, bringing it home, John James, I think he said he supported Trump 2,000%. Mm -hmm. I think you, that to me, 
that shows the lack of character that you have, you know, where your ethics are and where your, where, where your morals are. When you support somebody that is wrong as Trump is, and he's wrong as what $3 bills and, you know, all less, less shoes, okay? And uh, I just think that, um, you know, Bernie is the man. I mean, I mean not Bernie, but um, Biden is the man. And if you look at Sanders, I mean, come on, let's get real here. Sanders is not a Democrat, okay? The man's an independent. And, you know, he, I know he's kind of like sways and he votes mostly Democratic, but he is a independent. And, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's time for Joe Biden. And, I well, mean, you know, it's like Orson Welles said in that commercial, we sell no wine before it's time, no, no disrespect <laughs> to all the other <laughs> candidates. It's not time to sell their wine. <laughs> well, let me, let me uh, just touch on something yeah. you mentioned, Tom. You said about John James supporting Trump 2,000%. He just went and deleted that tweet. He just went and deleted all of his uh, his Facebook and everything like that. Oh, yeah, I saw yeah, that. Uh, because John even James John James is starting to realize that supporting Trump 2,000% isn't a good idea anymore. You know See, what? but I'm going to tell you something, Tom. You know, uh, what the Democrats have to be careful about, and uh, and Donald Trump did it well with the Russians, the, the, the voter suppression had, you know, talking about uh, Biden's past. They can go back in Biden's past when he voted for those crime bills and things like that. And so they, we have to be careful because black folks are not going to go along like they did in the past. And so I'm, you know, I'm with Kamala Harris. And I'm letting people know the Black Caucus Executive Board endorsed Kamala Harris. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we're all Democrat. Okay. Cool. All right, Bernie, we're going to ask you to hold on for just a couple more minutes, okay. if that's okay. And we're going to go to break, sure. and we'll be right back. You're listening to 910 AM, The Superstation. <laughs> So, you've decided to go to college. That's cool. So, pop quiz. Which is a better way to earn your degree? Commute to college and fill your gas tank, get stuck in traffic, drive in bad weather, try to find a parking space, walk a half mile to class, or learn online at Independence University. In the park on a bench, on the beach on a towel, or on your couch with your kid, your campus is wherever you want it to be. You don't go to college. College goes to you. That's Independence. That's Independence University. You schedule classes around your schedule, and all your supplies, including a brand new laptop and tablet, are included with tuition. At Independence U, you'll learn from professional instructors with real work experience. You'll get personal support in school and employment assistance when you graduate. Get your degree, but keep your life. That's Independence. That's Independence University. So if you're really smart, you call now. Call 1-800-556-7791. Independence U for an independent U. Call 1-800-556-7791. Are you getting the most out of your Medicare plan? Are you sure? Many people with Medicare are eligible for plans that include extra benefits in addition to those found in original Medicare. Benefits like dental, vision, and prescription drug coverage. Call now to see if you're eligible to enroll. The consultation is free with no obligation to enroll. In addition to hospital and medical coverage, at no extra cost, you could also get coverage for prescription drugs, dental, hearing, vision, and more. In many areas, plans with benefits are available with $0 copays for many services, $0 monthly premiums, or $0 deductibles. That's hospital, medical, prescription drug, dental coverage, and more included in one plan with premiums that may be as low as $0 a month. Call now to see if you're eligible to enroll. The consultation is free and there's no obligation to enroll. Call 1-800-571-8580. That's 1-800-571-8580. Who said that? Me, down here. <gasps> what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. Well, uh, what are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. Don't you remember me? Don't you know that we miss you? Miss me? Who misses me? You know, all your friends in the forest. The trees, the pond, that little fort that you made out of branches. We all miss you. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. Oh, I guess that makes sense. The forest is not that far away. Have an adventure today. I'm sure your mom would take you. You're right. I should get out. I want to have fun. Play in puddles, catch frogs, and climb trees. Hey, Mom! Yeah, hon? <gasps> Stephen! What is that in 
your hand. It's my sense of adventure, Mom. It's told me we need to get out of the house and have some fun in nature today. Come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Because home is more than four walls and a roof. It's that porch swing on a summer night. It's pajamas with feet and everybody over for Sunday dinner. And that old stuffed chair in the living room you just can't get rid of. This is why you work a second job. This is why you learn to fix things yourself so you could save on repairs. Because home is your place, your memories, your family sleeping in their own beds at night. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. And now even more options are available. Call 888-995-HOPE today. That's 888-995-HOPE. Or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation. My name is Robert Ficano. You can join us at 313-778-7600. Uh, Tom Trusky, a community activist, uh, a local caterer today. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the donuts that he brought in. Uh, also, uh, Keith Williams, uh, chair of the Michigan Democratic Black Caucus, also works for the Wayne County Sheriff's Department, which is I'm very partial to. Uh, also, Scotty Bowman is with us here in the studio right now at this moment. Uh, and we have Bernie Porn, uh, a, a, a very, very uh, excellent uh, pollster that uh, I've known for a number of years and has been spot on with a number of his polls that uh, he's had for the state of Michigan and in particular southeastern Michigan. Bernie, quick question. Do you think that um, um, there's going to be any, and I don't know if you've polled on any of this, uh, with uh, Governor um, uh, Whitmere, I almost said Granholm, mm-hmm. Whitmere, uh, with the auto insurance and uh, what it did to the favorable, unfavorable. I, I saw some poll that said that she shot up past 50% for the first time because of that. But now you're having things such as uh, Benton Harbor uh, and in uh, things like that that are, you know, it, it's an up and down. It's a peaks and valley that always is in politics. But have you been able to do any polling on, on how she's standing in the state of Michigan? We included it in this poll. I was just going to mention that uh, uh, her numbers have improved in terms of her favorability numbers. It is now at 49% favorable, 26% unfavorable, and that's a, a, a significant improvement. And on her job rating, uh, she now has a positive rating, 45% positive to 38% negative with 17% undecided. That is a, a turnaround from our uh, March survey when uh, uh, there was a, a negative job rating. So uh, that, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, shows that uh, what she is doing, uh, people are approving her. The, the other thing that points to that is uh, we asked about the direction of the country and the state. 52 to 36 percent say that the country is off on the wrong track. And uh, uh, for Michigan, 46 uh, percent say it's in the right direction, 31 percent wrong track. 23% undecided, and on that question, it's always, uh, it's kind of like that old adage, good government is when my guys are in, and bad <laughs> government is when uh, their guys are in, because uh, on the direction of the country, uh, 83% of Democrats say they're off on the wrong track, and 51% of independents, but 71% of Republicans say that it's uh, headed in the right direction. On the state direction, uh, 53% of Democrats say it's headed in the right direction. Uh, independents are split, and uh, even Republicans, uh, uh, probably because they control the legislature, say 40, by 44 to 36% that uh, the state is headed in the right direction. So, uh, Bernie, oh, can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. I was working with another pollster, and we polled just African Americans, and we had it um, before the um, her state of the state, and the three top issues with African Americans poll five hundred. It was jobs, education, health care, and the roads were the bottom of the at the bottom of the barrel. In your polling, have you thought, thought about dealing just specifically with the African American that who's been loyal to the Democratic Party? But it seems like those issues that the people are polling about are not 
jiving with African Americans? We have uh, asked questions, and we always have uh, uh, 11 or 12 percent of our poll uh, uh, that uh, are uh, African Americans, and we have looked at the difference, and you're right on in that poll. Uh, jobs and, uh, and education uh, usually show up uh, at the top of concerns for African Americans, but among all voters, it's roads as number one, and it has been for the last couple of years. And uh, uh, so that's very consistent with, uh, with your, uh, your polling just among African Americans. Bernie, they talk about um, uh, the, the roads and stuff, but when you add the 45 cent proposed tax on it, does that change the outcome of what they think about uh, how to fund it? Uh, we tested another poll, poll question in the survey. Uh, we uh, tested a one and a half cent increase in the sales tax, and uh, it uh, was 44 uh, percent uh, support for it, 51 percent opposition. And uh, following the road uh, ballot proposal that Snyder pushed in 2015, we asked about a one cent increase just in the sales tax dedicated to roads, and that got 64 percent support. So if, if I were king for a day, I would think that a potential solution would be a one cent increase in the sales tax, uh, a 10, 15, whatever it needs to be in the gas tax, and maybe taking somewhere between a quarter and a third of the, of the uh, money that uh, uh, was cut for business taxes, re recoup that and have that go toward roads because I think that business, uh, in terms of the, the trucking, uh, they should uh, uh, have some kind of responsibility in terms of uh, paying for roads. And that, that, I think, could get you to the $2.5 uh, billion per year that they need. Okay. Uh, John, John, you're going to uh, join us here with uh, Bernie Porn. John? Yes, I, I would like to. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, you're yeah. a resident Republican. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, you know, every time, every time President Trump's opened his mouth, he gets a dental exam. I would like every one of these uh, Democrats, all 20 of them, to get a colonoscopy exam. I think the media should do a lot on them, and let's go, let's go digging in theirs. In their business. But you don't think they are? Look at what they've done to Joe Biden. I mean, they've gone after him now on what he did with Anita Hill. They, I mean, they regurgitate a lot of his uh, record, and he still seems to withstand the uh, the scrutiny. You know, uh, well, he's not. He's not withstanding. You know, people people out here, we're not that. Uh, hey. You know, we know. Hey, John, you know what I'm tired of, John? You know what I'm tired of? This is this <laughs> a square, square business, man. This is about to say square business in the hood. Uh, uh, Yo, guys, always blame Obama. Obama gave him a, a, a blessing, a good, a good economy. When Obama got uh, got the, inherited the presidency, the country was in a depression. Oh, hold on. It's a fact. The Obama's, uh, the, he, survived. He, he rescued the automotive industry. He bought, he bought my health care, and you have benefited some of the benefits from Barack Obama. Huh? I'm not, Obama. Obama's better than Clinton. Obama's Obama better than the clown you got right now. He was a star. And tell him, go oh, there. wait a minute. No, he did say the auto industry. They, that was federal funds that, the TARP funds that came in. Yeah, and President Bush started it. He did start the, the TARP funds, but it was, right. ob, ob, but it was ob, uh, President Obama that not only said General Motors, his staff was advising them against Chrysler, and he said, "No, we're going to well, save both minute. companies." Now, 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 you guys, hold on a second. Now, if you if you guys go read the Macomb Daily, and you look no, I don't want to read that day. paper. No, <laughs> it, 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 it's just like the rest of you guys out there. <laughs> well, no, it was, Nancy Pelosi was standing over the death knell of the auto industry, telling telling Obama, President Obama, and then you you build the cars we want. Remember when they flew the oil guys up there? And ask them for the uh, well, how come Exxon Mobil or Shell's making all kind of money? They said it's because you only make eight cents a gallon out of from the ground. You, you, know, you know, you know, I'm kind of believing you look. You look too much of at Fox News every day. <laughs> <laughs> You look too much because I, I don't understand your world. I, I'm trying to have affinity for you, but you you come off this off the wall stuff all the time. <laughs> No, I'm not off the wall. I'm just I'm I, I'm not Michael Jackson off the wall. Keith. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Michael, another level of off the wall. Yeah, but, 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 but Michael Jackson took it. 
He got, he got, you know that stuff that puts you in, when you get ready to get a colonoscopy, that's what you need right now. You know that <laughs> stuff that shoots you up with? <laughs> Oh, Keith. <laughs> okay. John, you have a great Father's Day. Appreciate you calling in. Take care. Hey, you got, hey Keith, you got Trump in you. I'm telling you. <laughs> you. If you look at Trump's Take eyes, something has happened to his eyes that turned it real white. I sort of like the orange hair myself. The orange hair, yeah. man. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, John. We appreciate it. Uh, Bernie, any final thoughts here on what you see in the polling? Well, uh, one thing, uh, uh, not in our poll, but in national polls uh, and, and in other polls in, in Michigan, it shows that uh, independents are not uh, supporting impeachment. And Nancy Pelosi is trying to hold off on impeachment to protect her marginal districts, uh, but she wants to do the investigation. And one thing that I think would be uh, make good sense for Democrats, if they're going to follow that path, when asked about impeachment, say, no, we want to investigate, uh, but uh, we don't want to deny voters the opportunity to cast their vote on the issue of impeachment in the next election. Because, Bernie, uh, Bernie this, is com think, this is Commissioner Willie Byrd. I just want to know, how is the Hispanic Latino community, who are they putting their support behind? How, how are they what? Who are they putting their support behind? The Latino community, are they focused on one particular candidate? Uh, no. We, uh, the uh, end size for the Hispanic community in Michigan is not large enough to uh, come to any conclusions. We would have to do a poll uh, screening for just Hispanics. And okay. uh, uh, there just is not enough of an end size of Hispanics to really come to any conclusions. An end size of just 50 respondents uh, to any given question is a error rate of plus or minus 13.9 percent. And so we, we don't have uh, uh, even 50 respondents in a 600 samples poll of Hispanics. And so, Bernie, uh, 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 the final end of this is if I'm a Democratic congressperson, do I, want, do I vote for impeachment uh, before the 2020 election? Well, it, uh, if, if you're in a strong Democratic seat, why uh, there's overwhelming support among Democrats for impeachment. However, if you're in a marginal competitive seat and you need independent voters to win, I think that uh, you have to be serious in asking yourself whether or not you want to do that. That's why I think it is a good idea to have investigations and re reveal to the public all of the things that uh, uh, are true about uh, obstruction in the Mueller report and other issues like the financial connections and potential financial connections with Russia. And also, uh, if we ever get his tax returns, <laughs> that's going to... Yeah, that, that looks really long-term. They're going to fight that forever. But let me ask you a question real quick, Bernie. In, uh, in the congressional races and the Senate races, how's Gary Peters doing and how's Rashida Tlaib doing? We have not asked a, uh, uh, a, uh, a question on the uh, U.S. Senate race. That will be on the next one uh, because it was just announced that uh, uh, John James uh, would run. And while he did very impressively, I think, in running against uh, Debbie Stabenow, uh, the, uh, uh, I think the background and the uh, history of uh, Gary Peters is much different because uh, uh, John James cannot uh, tout is a military experience because uh, uh, Gary Peters has the same thing. Yeah. And so, Bernie, Bernie but did, what about you, Rashida? And Rashida, we, uh, I think that she uh, uh, represents her uh, her district, and uh, they're not going to, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, balk her. I think they're probably very supportive of her. But we we have not done any yeah. polling in that. Uh, there's that area, there's but, rumors or discussions that she might be primary uh, with one single African American candidate out of uh, Detroit. So that would be an interesting situation to see. Anyway. We know that Rashida is going to raise tons of dollars. Um, that's you know that we do know. But do you think she can be vulnerable going in going into the upcoming election? I mean, you know, here it is. Um, looking at the issues, um, I mean, she's doing a lot of going against Trump, attacking Trump, talking about impeachment. But do you think that she's going to be vulnerable next go around? I mean, she won uh, pretty much with a, you know, 
landslide, but I mean. Well, she won because there were so many candidates. Yeah, she, split she, it up. She, she snuck up in there. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm still, uh, to this day, Bernie, I don't think uh, she has really a, 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 uh, got the real support of African Americans in that, in that district. But in order for her to hold that seat mm-hmm. that she has, what issues would she have to speak up on, start turning some things around? The question is, she does look vulnerable going into the upcoming election. This is not what I'm seeing. This is what, you know, um, um, citizens Some of the grassroots saying. stuff is percolating a little bit, but it's hard to tell if it's, if it's really, um, you know, uh, uh, district-wise or is it just, you know, people that are sort of grousing. The, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. And well, someone like Bernie well, could I, do a poll and probably. I, I was just going to say, <laughs> I, 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 you know, anecdotally, I don't know enough, but I can. I would gladly do a poll forever for whoever would like to pay for it. I can uh, tell you exactly what. Uh, Give me a call. Get my number from Bob. <laughs> get you, get my number from Bob. Okay. Looks like we got some clients for you here, Bernie. I, Bernie, I want to I want to thank you for. I'll gladly do a poll. Bernie, I want to thank you for coming on. You've uh, your numbers have always held. Uh, and actually, you were one of the few that saw the uh, actual uh, trend uh, going in uh, Michigan that was going to actually support Trump in 2016. So, oh, I've always had a lot of uh, I've always had a lot of um, uh, admiration for what you've been able to do. And, and thanks for coming on. Okay. Well, I appreciate the compliments, and it's always a pleasure to join you and uh, your listeners. Bob, Bob. Thanks. Um, I mean, not Bob. Uh, Bernie. Yes. You know. I'm I'm not saying nothing, but um, you know, a couple of years ago when I ran for re-election, did you see that? Did you see me pulling that off? I mean, I did win it by sixty-five percent. I hate to, t- I hate to tell you, he didn't poll for you. Yeah, so you I want him to, to poll you. for you? I hate, go ahead and give him a check. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> and I hate to tell you, there's give a different between. I'll, I'll give you a friends and family uh, rate. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, what I do know, there's a difference between rabbit hunting and bear hunting. Yeah. <laughs> Bernie, thanks for coming out. We I gotta teach that. you how to fish okay. fry. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Bernie, thanks again. All right. You're uh, welcome. Take care. Okay, the last segment here. We're getting in. We have an attorney in studio with us, Mr. David Helm. Uh, one of the issues that has come up in a lot of discussion has to do with surrounding the Democratic Party. And if you've seen last, uh, I believe it was last Thursday, when uh, Dana Nessel uh, dismissed all the charges against all uh, Flint um, defendants in the case, there was... Seven of them have already uh, pled guilty to some type of uh, charge, but there's another eight or nine, including Mr. Lyons, who was probably the biggest, quote, fish uh, that was uh, being tried or had been bound over by a preliminary exam and at at that point was facing uh, charges in the Flint water crisis. Um, For those that don't understand, it is a weird mix that the attorney general does that represents both sides in this. So uh, there's the criminal side and the civil side. There was a number of people that sued the state of Michigan uh, for the Flint water crisis. She, uh, the attorney general, is still uh, at, is still defending on that, and she, by by constitutional uh, obligation, is defending on that. But she, they put up what they call a firewall in the in the attorney general's office, and so the criminal side is actually handled usually by outside firms. We saw with Shudi that it was. Uh, 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 some people he brought uh, from both the uh, FBI and uh, the former Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, Dana Nessel got in, and she switched it over to Kim Worthy and to um, uh, someone else that was in uh, Kim's, uh, made her solicitor general that was uh, came out of Kim's uh, uh, shop. So to discuss this with us and uh, some of the ramifications, both politically and legally, we have met Hel- uh, David Helm with us here uh, this morning. How are you doing, David? Not too bad yourself. Thanks for having me, by the way. Sure, sure, sure. Any uh, quick thoughts on what uh, Dana Nessel did and, and how she did it and what uh, what it uh, ended up uh, resulting in? Well, I think it's important to understand that it, it appears that this is a procedural issue, that she had some problems with the evidence. And just because the case is dismissed, it's without prejudice, and she can definitely bring it again in the future. I think she needs to get, um, you know, I think this is a transitional phase for her. She needs to get it into the hands of whoever she's going to be heading it up, and then they will, they'll will they reissue charges. These aren't going away if, if they feel like the evidence is there. Yeah, one of the problems that you have with it is that, unfortunately, many times evidence, and now it's going to three years, Right. Uh, people's memories, evidence, uh, and things like that, uh, 
tend to either disappear, memories tend to fog, uh, and, and people that you had in there that was uh, actually uh, pursuing it, uh, you know, you got a whole new set of people that are, in essence, learning the ropes or learning what the case is all about, which probably I would guess makes it more difficult uh, in order to uh, to withstand that. Uh, well, they also might have new theories, though, and a new approach, and it might actually be more successful. Um, like you said, it's been three years, and these charges were still pending, and nothing was really happening. So this might be a good thing. Uh, I don't know. To the panel, a lot of people think that uh, what she really wants to do is go after uh, Governor Snyder, that that was at, that it was never really pursued by uh, then Attorney General uh, Schuette, that uh, the, and the, we saw that in, there was a bit of a quandary, or I guess mix-up. They, uh, they subpoenaed his phone. He yeah. said, look, yeah, I yeah, already turned the phone. phone over to the Attorney General, so you're subpoenaing yourself, basically, you know, for Bob, turning it over. Yeah. Yeah. That whole thing was outright negligence, man, what they did to those people in Flint. And then they didn't come back and give them money to refix the problem, fix the problem that was caused by corroded prior, or, uh, corroded um, pipes and things like that. And General Motors, you know, they left, they left um, the Flint with all that um, that uh, that poison out of those plants. So it's a lot of people that should have been been called, uh, you know, called out about this, man. One of the pr- basic problems that you have is when you have someone like Governor Snyder saying he wants to run the business. Yes. runs the state like a business, is that he was getting reports back to him that said the water's okay, the water's okay, and either they were distorting the reports or they were lying about it. However it came about, reports were coming across his desk saying it was okay, right? So as a business person, he says, well, I look at the numbers. The numbers say that it that it gel, you know, that it makes sense that we got to continue on. The problem you have is a politician would have seen General Motors was pulling their engines away from that Flint water because it was corroding their engines. Well, and a that normal people, politician yeah, would say, right. "What the heck? I'm not. I don't care what the numbers say. I'm going to sit there and take some action because General Motors isn't stupid yeah. in pulling these engines and away." And listen to the, the people who are coming to the Capitol who are bringing the water out of their taps. That was discolored Brown. and saying, I'm going to believe the people. I'm going to believe the voters, not just the numbers and the emails. Though still, too, we did see there were emails that he did receive that were marked as red that did say there was a problem. And he had previously spoken to, I think, uh, Bob and, and, and David, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but he previously said on the record, if not even in a legal setting, that he did not know about it at a certain time. But that was that was demonstrably false. He did lie to Congress, I believe it was. Well, if... <laughs> Could have been he could have just said, "Hey, you know, we made a mistake." Well, there's liability well, attached to that. Well, there, there is, and there is <laughs> liability. I mean, attached to there that. there is government immunity <laughs> here that we're that we're dealing with, which is a huge thing to overcome here when we're talking about I think both Supreme, civilly. The United States Supreme Court has that issue in front of them, don't they? Yeah, they bit? do. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that is a huge hurdle that needs to be overcome before any of this can go forward, both civilly and and criminally. The the, the government immunity is is strong with with the uh, the individuals who the charges were just dismissed against. So, um, so that probably played a big factor into that too. And yes, it is up. I believe. Um, I don't know when the arguments are uh, going to take place, and maybe they're sitting back and waiting for that. They do have another three years that they can bring charges against. Yeah, statute of limitations. Yeah, run six for years another, total. Uh, run for that. So it's it's going to be interesting uh, what they do. And criminally, uh, is there statute of limitations on the criminal aspect of it? Is it three uh, years or four years? I can't remember. For murder, there is no statute of limitations. Right. So these are manslaughter charges, and off the top of my head, I don't know. The general statute of limitations for criminal acts is six years. Yeah, okay. Well, it's going to be interesting what they do. And I think the other issue they have is that to explain why they're dismissing all of these issues, they're waiting till June 28th at a town hall meeting, which the people, you know, that allows all sorts of rumors and innuendo and everything else to happen, probably politically, to have come out and say, I'm dismissing it for these particular reasons, might have uh, uh, eased people's uh, concerns in Flint a lot more versus waiting till the 28th to try to explain it. You know, Bob, uh, Dana is a very activist attorney general, man. She She's going after the priest. And, she's, <laughs> she's and she going, said, don't show me your rosary. Oh, but think about don't this, Bob. Learning. The other day, the, you know, this is kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> the Catholic, uh, the Catholic uh, church. church. Had, had their meeting down somewhere. Yeah, and, on and, the Archdiocese. And, 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 and the Southern Baptists had a meeting, too. And it, guess what the deal was? Well, guess what the issue was? 
sexual sexual abuse. This sexual abuse, man. So somebody went on Facebook. Uh, when they gonna call out the hypocrites, man? <laughs> well, one of the one of the one of the problems that you have is that now the archdiocese says they are going to track and report uh, abuses. You know, they do that, Bob. Well, sure, they can do it. The question is, why haven't they been doing it? If somebody actually comes to you and says, they're, you know, one of the you know, members of your flock is, is abusing someone, at that point, you really do have an obligation to act. Uh, I mean, the accountability has to be See, there. Bob, and it's making sure that they report it to the police. They've been yeah, recording just, it, but they don't, they're not saying that they have to report it to it police. It's very fuzzy how they yeah. report it. It's a good old boy system, man. Yeah. Hey, you know what the problem is, Bob? They should just go let the man have, a, let the guys have a woman, man. <laughs> they, they can solve the problem, man. <laughs> okay, well, they, you, you know, should priests get married, which yeah, is one yeah, of the big yeah, things that's part them, of it. And people really married. misperceive why that came about. Because the first three or four hundred years, I believe Catholic priests could get married. It's, it's now, but a lot of the uh, assets in the church and stuff got commingled, and so the spouses of some of the priests started, uh, that passed away started to challenge whether they were in control of the asset, you know, the property and stuff like that. And at that point, the Catholic Church says, you know what, from now on, you aren't going to get married. That way, clearly, the asset's going to, you know, be a legacy to the church and not to any family. But it causes a whole lot of other problems when they don't give up the money. <laughs> That's interesting. I always thought it was uh, it was uh, married to God sort of approach. Well, it, it, it has morphed into that, but I think the original decision was a financial one that they uh, originally were looking at. Now, that makes more sense. At. Yeah. In other words, it, it was, sir, I can't even say married to God, but God said we put we put cocaine. You know what I'm saying? They said yeah. babies. So well, that's a contradiction, man. You know, <laughs> you've turned real biblical on us here, kids. Yeah, yeah. If he say if he said make babies, then then then, 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 the, then the Catholic Church said that to God, God already gave you an instruction. Yeah. You know, question for Dave. You know, just to change the subject for just split second, is that you know Dana Nessel is only six months into office right now. Do you think she's doing a pretty good job? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, I, I really haven't seen a whole lot come out of her office um, myself. I haven't really been uh, paying attention to her too closely. She's only six months in. Um, but uh, this, I think, is, is telling. I, I think the fact that she stepped back and dismissed the charges, I think, is the sign of a, uh, of a reasonable mind, and that's what I'd like to see in that office, someone who's actually willing to step back and take a look at the situation and then move forward as she sees most appropriate, not just – necessarily bending to the tide of public opinion, I think, is what we need to have in there, and I think that's a great um, decision. She so she, you say she's, she's doing something different than Bill Schuette did. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Because, Bill, I know he, he was very political, man, and I think she's uh, she's very thoughtful in her approach. I, I, I would say she's very thoughtful in her approach, and I think it's very um, – uh, it's, it's nice to see that. You know, also talking about the Attorney General, uh, there were also uh, – charges when we're talking about it uh, in the Michigan State case. It looks like uh, Luann Simon, the president, is going to be bound over. They have what they call, these are the longest preliminary exams I've ever seen. Uh, they, they're, they, one of them, I think hers has gone on a month. Um, and I know there's several adjournments. They go for a day, they adjourn, right. and things like that. Uh, but they are presenting, and, and the judge did not give a good indication that she was uh, – uh, going to uh, not bind her over, saying that she saw agenda no uh, meeting notices about, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Nasser and, and things like that, and that she did not really take any uh, positive action to stop it when she had the knowledge of it. So that that was uh, uh, carrying over as well. There was one other, too, involving that uh, uh, case uh, uh, with Dr. Nasser that also I think the AG was involved in this week. So she's been really active in what's been going on here as of late. Yeah, and that is um, that that's a well, that's a horrible situation, and it's also hard um, in those situations. Well, just like the water issue is, you have to prove the knowledge, and then you also have to prove the um, the, the the affirmative duty to act, and then you have to, on top of that, you have to get past the 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 immunity. Um, so on all three counts, these are not easy cases to prosecute, and the fact that it's going on for months on the preliminary exam, um, I think is is normal under these sort of circumstances with with especially with that particular case um just with there's so many people involved there's so many allegations there's so many incidences there's so many communications and and, and meetings about it yeah um, luann simon has said that yeah the 
administrator came to her and said, we got a problem. Uh, she di They didn't identify who the doctor was. So it bridges over. Well, once you know there's a problem, how much of a, an accounting should you have engaged in yeah. in instead of just saying, well, go take care of it or not paying any attention to it? Yeah, so that's the, you know, basically after the fact, putting an affirmative duty on her to act in a certain way where one person would say it's reasonable and another person would say it isn't. It's really, it's a gray area. It's, it's tough to prosecute that way. And one of the things, and it's not going to help them at all, but uh, the final thing with uh, Dr. Nasser, I think, which in a different circumstance would have led to some uh, legal challenges, were the victim impact statements. Uh, at his trial, uh, he was actually convicted of uh, sexually abusing like four people or something like that. The judge allowed like over 100 uh, victim impact statements from people who alleged that he had abused them, but it was never proven, which legally might have created an issue uh, of impacting the, the actual sentencing because he was never convicted of those particular people abusing it. Everybody believes that he did, but... You know, the, it, but yeah. I think he is in such a bad place that no judge, no court's going to reverse it at this point anyway. Yeah, I mean, so what are they going to do? They're going to say that that was improper. They're going to reverse it back down for an additional sentencing, and he's going to get the exact same, same sentence thing. that he got yeah, before. Exactly. Um, I think it's going to be a moot issue. Um, you know, with with the sentencing too, though, is you're trying to show the character of the person. So a lot of times the the defendant will bring in family members, friends, people like that that will vouch for them and say this was, you know. A misunderstanding, he's a good guy, that sort of thing. And it, I think it kind of goes along the same lines, just opposite. I don't really think there was any error there. I think it was ridiculous. I think it was showboating because there were a lot of them. Um, maybe you could have gotten away with maybe eight. Twenty. Yeah, <laughs> 20. Yeah. You know? Ten, something like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it was a lot, but I don't think it's reversible. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, David, appreciate you coming by. I want to thank everybody that was here today. Uh, Scotty Bowman, Keith Williams, and... Police Commissioner Willie Burton and Tom Chesky, all of you for uh, being here. Uh, I see, the, David, you got your son here on Father's Day. Yes, I do. Uh, he oh. decided to take along. Okay, great, great. Well, to all the fathers out there, we want to wish you a happy birthday. Maxine, thank you, as always, running the board and taking all the calls and everything else. We appreciate it. You have a great Father's Day, and you're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation, and we'll be back next week. That's, that's Omar than